afternoon. We're going to get started. This is our last, your last lecture of OCHEM. Bittersweet moment, right? <laughs> All right. So we are going to finish up the carbohydrates chapter, and then. Um, I will have a discussion after this and then I will see, I'll have office hours from 2 to 3, extra office hours, and then I will see you at the review tonight, okay? Any questions before we get started? Any questions about the final? Uh, nobody, huh? Yes? Will there be any nomenclature? There will be terminology for carbohydrates but not any IUPAC nomenclature. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. He asked if we have to memorize the open chain forms of uh, the only sugar that you have to memorize is uh, glucose and fructose. Up at the top. Really loud. Can you guys quiet down so I can hear her? Ah, oh, doggone it. I'll have to email you about that. Once I write the test, I'll email you about that. Okay, any other questions? Over here? Yes. What? The review is from 6 to 8 in HSLH, right? BioSci Lecture Hall? Okay, anything else? HSLH. Used to be called BioSci Lecture Hall, now it's HSLH. All right. So we left off last time almost finishing talking about reactions of sugars, and so we, we ended with reduction. And so this is um, an aldatol. And you can see the OL is for alcohol, so that's an aldatol. And we also talked about the fact that when you reduce that sugar, you turn it into something that's achiral. So even though it has three planes of symmetry, I mean three stereocenters, it has a plane of symmetry, so it is actually achiral. All right. Let's talk about disaccharides. All right, so we were talking about um, the different types of linkages, 1, 4 prime, 1, 6 prime, and 1, 1 prime, and you need to be able to know how to label those linkages. All right, and so we were also talking about reducing sugars and non-reducing sugars. So let's label these as reducing sugars. We have, as long as we have one anomeric carbon as a hemiacetal, then it is a reducing sugar. So this is um, a hemiacetal, so that's a reducing sugar. That's a hemiacetal, so that's also a reducing sugar. So um, if you oxidize this, you'll oxidize right here. This will still stay intact. Okay, so you're going to oxidize right here. You're going to oxidize right here. This ring will still stay intact. All right, so this is um, a reducing sugar. And this is also a reducing sugar. All right, so we've also talked about the fact that, what, did we label this 1,4 prime glucosidic linkage? Here's Gentibios. Uh, it's a beta 1,6 prime glucosidic linkage between two glucose units. And so we have um, sugar number one. This is glucose. And this is also glucose. The 1, 6 prime linkage is rare in disaccharides. It's usually common as branch points in polysaccharides. So if you have a long um, saccharide chain, then the 1, 6 prime is the, the branch is um, cross-linking between the two chains. Um, but here is an example of a real um, beta 1, 6 prime in a, in a um, disaccharide. And so we, you recognize this is glucose. You recognize this is glucose. So this right here is um, beta. 
because that, o, that OR group is equatorial, so it's beta. And it is bonded through carbon one. This is one, two, three, four, five, six. Carbon one of, of sugar one. And it's bonded through, um, let's, let's label those in it, let's knit, number those in a different color, through carbon number six of the second sugar. One, two, three, four, five. Um, did I skip one? One, two, three, four, five, six. No, here we go. Through carbon number six. Bonded through uh, carbon six, whoops carbon six of the second sugar. So therefore a, a beta one six prime and the glucosidic um, is specific for sugar number one being glucose. Sucrose on the other hand um, is a, it's, it's sometimes called a one one prime. It's also called, it's actually a one two prime. And so you'll recognize, um, we we're going to call it, this is, so this is, of course, is table sugar. Sugar number one is glucose. Um, notice um, it is um, this hydroxyl on, on glucose, this OR is, uh, is alpha. And it is, um, so this is an alpha uh, glycosidic linkage on um, glucose. So we can call it an alpha, eh, let me just erase that. Alpha glucosidic linkage. On glucose. Notice in sucrose it's unusual because it's the anomeric carbon of sugar one and the anomeric carbon of sugar two are actually the ones that are bonded together. All right, so this, on the other hand, is beta. This is a beta um, linkage at carbon number two. And so because we have the anomeric carbon of both sugars, it's a one, one prime, but it's actually a one, two prime because if you number um, fructose, let's number both of them. This is one, two, three, four, five, six. If you number fructose, we start right here. One, two, three, four, five, six. So we're actually bonded through carbon number two. Through the oxygen on carbon two. So if I have any kind of linkage like this on the test, I would accept either a one, one prime or a one, two prime. Can call I, either name. If, is, this a, um, is this a reducing sugar? I'm seeing some head shaking. No, this is a non-reducing sugar. And that's because there are no hemiacetals in this, in this molecule. Both of the anomeric carbons are bonded together. Yes? Uh, glycosidic is, 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 is generic. And, uh, and more specific is where you use the name for the uh, for sugar number one. Specific would be glucosidic. So it's a glycosidic bond, so that's the generic name. So on the test, I'll say be as specific as possible. And so you, rather than writing glycosidic, you would write glucosidic for sugar number one. Okay? Questions on that? Anybody? All right, so um, we're not going to talk about oligosaccharides, but we are going to jump right to polysaccharides. 
And so here's cellulose, a polymer of D-glucose with the beta-1,4 prime linkage. You recognize that right away, right? So here's, um, let's number here, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six. So what we're looking for is we're bonded through carbon number four. Carbon four of second sugar. And um, this is beta. So the, and, and, and since each, each of some mutant is glucose, then this is a beta one four prime glucosidic linkage. All right, and so we don't have the, we don't have the capability of digesting cellulose. Uh, humans and other mammals can't digest cellulose because we don't have the beta glucosidase enzyme that you need to do this. Um, it's very difficult to digest. So um, beta glucosidase is synthesized only by bacteria, such as the di digestive bacteria of ruminants and termites, so like cows. When cows eat hay, they have bacteria in their stomach that make this enzyme so they can break apart the uh, cellulose uh, b bonding. Even so, it's even still very hard for them because don't they, don't they regurgitate and then swallow back again and then regurgitate and swallow back again? Yeah, so, and then even then, they're only digesting about 30% 30, 30 of it. And that's why cow droppings look like, you know, grass because that's all the undigested grass in there. So it's really hard to digest. We, on the other hand, are designed to digest not the beta 1,4 um, prime, but the, beta, the alpha 1,4 prime. So all of the starches, glycogen, amylose, all of the starches are alpha. So we're, notice we're bonded through carbon number four of the second sugar. And this is alpha. Each one of these units is glucose. So this is an um, alpha one four prime glucosidic linkage. All right, and here's an example. So this is, um, this is amylose right here. And this is amylopectin, another sugar. And so all of these bonds right here are all the 1,4 one, one prime, alpha 1,4 prime glucosidic linkages. And here's what I was talking about right here. So we have a long polymer chain of 1,4 prime glucosidic linkages. And now we have one of these 1,6 prime that are, that are cross-linking these two polymer chains. So this right here is an alpha 1,6 prime um, glucosidic linkage. And this is called a branch point. So, so seriously, the only difference between, um, if we scroll back up, and I, I will scroll back down again, the only difference between cellulose, which we can't digest, and starch, which we can digest, is that we don't have the enzyme necessary to do the beta-1,4 prime linkage. And completely different physical properties just because of the stereochemistry of that one carbon. So because of this, because if, if you look at the way I've drawn cellulose, it actually makes long sheets like this. And then there's hydrogen bonding between the sheets. Um, in starch, it's not long sheets because of this subtle stereochemical distance. We actually, this actually kinks the molecule into an alpha helix. And so you have all these hydroxyls on the outside which interact with the environment so you get a lot of hydrogen bonding and so these are all water soluble. Cellulose of course is not water soluble. That's why when it rains, our trees don't dissolve, our grass doesn't dissolve, okay? So they don't hydrogen bond, uh, but the starches do. So um, pretty trippy when you think about that, that it's just the stereochemistry at one, at one site in the molecule. 
So, um, so this is uh, alpha linkage. Kinks the polymer chain into an alpha helix. Therefore, we have increased hydrogen bonding. Therefore, it's so soluble in water. Cellulose is not. So most of the hydrogen bonding in cellulose is happening between its own molecules and not with the um, water in the environment. And so glycogen is similar to um, amylopectin, but has more of these uh, one six prime crosslinks. Questions on polysaccharides? Anybody? We only have three more pages left. No, four more pages. That's awesome. Okay. So I want to move on to talk about some other things with sugars. Sweeteners, fats, drugs derived from sugar. So I don't know if you're aware that you know, the latest research is coming out about cholesterol and heart disease. And fat is not the em enemy that it was painted out to be. Um, actually, sugar is the enemy. Sugar is the reason why. Yeah, we all love sugar, but sugar is the problem, not fats. And that's why while we have, while we have cut down on fat, uh, we have increased our sugar intake and people have gotten heavier and more heart disease, okay? So there's a lot of interest in artificial sweeteners. We like things sweet, I mean that we're naturally made that way. So why don't we have some artificial sweeteners that we can use that aren't going to um, have this effect? And so here's some, uh, some common artificial sweeteners that you probably have run across. These guys here, um, deglucitol, demanitol, dexylitol, zemaltitol, Demaltitol. Uh, these are sugar alcohols. If you've ever gone on an Atkin diet, Atkins diet where you're not supposed to have any carbohydrates or very low carbohydrates, you're familiar with these um, alcohols. This is actually sorbitol. So if you look on labels, you'll see this in a lot of gums, toothpaste, things like that. They don't want to, they want your toothpaste to taste good, but they don't want to put sugar in it, right? Because it's just going to feed the bacteria that eat your gums away. I mean, your teeth away. So um, they add sorbitol because it's sweet. Um, this is made from reduction of what? Which sugar? Yes, it's made from reduction of glucose. Then there's D-mannitol. Um, this is reduction from, from reduction of mannose. And then D-xylitol actually is a really good one because it, um, it prevents bacteria from sticking to um, mucous membranes and um, adhering to cells in the gum, nasal passages, and all of this kind of stuff. So this is uh, made from reduction of xylose. So it prevents bacteria from adhering to cells in the nose, mouth, gums, etc. So if you chew a gum that's made with xylitol, it's actually going to cut down on the number of cavities that you have. Hearing to bacteria in gum. Nasal passages. So they use, also use this in nasal spray too. Nasal passages and um, mouth. I guess that would be your gums, right? It also aids in remineral, it binds to calcium and aids in remineral, min, remineralizing your teeth. So it's got a lot of good qualities. Um, and then there's maltitol, again, if you've ever been on an Atkins diet and you they have these sugar-free candies or sugar-free chocolates and things like that. Um, and, and what they warn you on the label is um, don't eat too much or it will cause severe gastric disturbances. And they really do mean that. 
They really, really do mean that. My sister, um, when I was a teenager, my sister ate a whole bag of, of sugar-free candy, and her stomach was out to here, like this, honestly. It was just, she was, looked like she was seven months pregnant, and she was in a lot of pain. So you really, they really do mean that. So maltitol also a sugar alcohol. All of the sugar alcohols are difficult to digest. So it's okay if you have some in some gum, that's not very much, but if you're eating a food that is significantly sweetened with these, it causes a lot of um, gastrointestinal distress, we'll say. Um, difficult to digest. Excess causes, we'll, we'll, just, we'll just kind of like say severe gastrointestinal, that sounds, I can't even spell today, intestinal issues. We'll just say issues rather than getting specific <laughs> about it. Um, so, uh, and then this is, uh, this is sucralose Splenda, also an artificial sweetener. It, it actually has zero calories, and it's made from sucrose. So it goes through um, like a three or four step process, and during that process, um, this OH on fructose gets converted to a chlorine, um, this gets converted to a chlorine, and this gets converted to a chlorine, but it also epimerizes. So during synthesis, because remember, this is from um, this is from sucrose. So that that hydroxyl that this chlorine is replacing should be equatorial, and it's not. So during synthesis, C4 on glucose epimerizes. So we change to the other epimer. All right, and then there's some newer things. Um, D-tagatose is actually, um, they're trying to build a market for D-tagatose as, an, as a natural, uh, naturally occurring um, sweetener. So this is naturally occurring. It is 92% as sweet as sucrose. but it only has 38% of the calories. It has a low, glyce low, glow, low glycemic index, so it doesn't have really any effect on insulin levels, very little effect on insulin levels, blood sugar. And um, the problem is that it, it, um, when, you, you, when you bake with it, it turns things black. So your baked goods uh, problem turns baked goods black. So you can't really bake with it. So it browns too quickly. Um, the holy grail for people who would like to make a lot of money on artificial sweeteners is um, L-glucose. Um, if you could make L-glucose economically, it tastes exactly like glucose, tastes just like sugar, it bakes just like sugar, but it is not digested by the body. So you could have everything that you eat right now if you could come up with an inexpensive synthesis of L-glucose, I think people would be even really willing to pay lots of money for it because it tastes exactly real. So maybe somebody out here is going to come up with a synthesis of L-glucose and we can use that. The problem is, is that um, with all these artificial um, sweeteners is whenever you're ingesting large amounts of something that's not digested, it causes problems with your intestines. Okay, So, so digestive issues, and the other thing they're finding is that, that these artificial sweet, sweeteners are, um, alter the brain's taste and response signaling. signaling. So people who, who do these all the time, um, they crave more sugar, number one, more real sugar. But after a while, they lose the ability to distinguish between something that's artificially sweetened and really sweetened. So it's like you, you have something that's artificially sweetened and your body says, I want more of that because I'm not really getting the sugar that I'm thinking I'm getting from that. It kind of messes with that signaling. So really, the bottom line is we really need to um, eat less sugar. You know? Lose our sweet tooth.
All right. So this is Olestra. Can you, can you dig out the um, sugar that's buried in this molecule? What is that? It's also made from sucrose. And what they've done, very clever, um, they've, they've put long, long um, acid chains. So basically this is fake fat that is not digestible. It's, it's completely fake fat. Um, these are long chains, so these are fatty acids, but the body doesn't have the ability to hydrolyze these esters, so they stay on and they get passed right through the body. Um, I don't even know if this is still around anymore. They used it and there was light lays. Do they still sell light lays? I don't know. Again, uh, lots of problems when you ingest food that's not to be digested. So um, gastrointestinal problems if you eat too many you know, of these Lay's chips and everything. Um, the, the sad thing is, is they, they put like 30, 30 years and $2 billion to develop. And I don't think it really has taken off. And $2 billion. And of course, sad news is now fat's not the culprit, sugar is. So that was like a wasted, you know, effort, right? So again, it's fake fat. Too hindered to be digested. All right, and this is, um, so that's Olestra. Uh, this is a, 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 a disaccharide uh, found in the seeds of food such as cherries, peaches, and apricots. When it's carefully hydrolyzed at low temperature the, and the product is oxidized, you get this compound latril, which was very big in the 70s as an alternative cancer treatment. And what happens is, if you notice right here, if you hydrolyze this, And it is hydrolyzed when it goes into your body. If you hydrolyze, it's a glycoside. And if you hydrolyze the glycoside, you get um, glucose plus. And hopefully you'll, re you'll recognize the functional group on this molecule right here. What would that functional group be called? It's a cyanohydrin, right? Is that a reversible reaction forming a cyanohydrin? Yes. yes. It undergoes, um, and we'll draw it down here because I didn't leave myself enough room. It undergoes reverse uh, cyanohydrin formation in the body. to yield um, an aldehyde and HCN, hydrogen cyanide. And this is actually catalyzed by beta-glucosidase. So catalyzed <coughs> beta-glucosidase. And so uh, a lot of people, uh, a lot of people died from taking Latril. And so it was like everybody, it was kind of one of these things where it was sort of painted as this is the miracle drugs your doctor doesn't want you to know about because they want to use their own drugs that they're making money on and they don't want you to get well because then they won't have any patients. You really need to try it. So people would go down to Mexico to take the latril and they would end up dying. So, because it's cyanide, you're giving yourself cyanide. Anyway, just thought you'd like that story. So a couple more um, different sugar types and we're gonna finish early today. Um, all right, so, 
What does this molecule look like? It's glucose, but one of the, this hydroxyl right here has been changed to an amine. So this is D-glucosamine. A popular um, natural remedy for arthritis, it's mixed with chondroitin to treat osteoarthritis, so it's a very popular thing that you could buy in a lot of stores. Um, it's not really super proven to be effective, but a lot of people feel it is and they still buy it. Um, so that's, that's a good example of that. And then there's N-glycosides, which are um, like glycosides, except instead of a, an oxygen here, you'd have a nitrogen. So here's an example right here. We'll draw this here and we'll get a little practice drawing chairs. I'm drawing a squiggly line of, because of course I have a mixture of anomers. And the mechanism for this is going to look just like the mechanism for when we formed a glycoside earlier in this chapter. Okay, so same exact thing. We have a little bit of uh, acid catalyst. The amine's going to, we're going to kick off this hydroxyl and then the amine's going to attack. And so you can also find this mechanism is the same as formation of a carbon carbonolamine. which is similar to a hemiacetal, and that from a ketone or an aldehyde, which we learned in, on page 46 of the notes. All right, so that's an N-glycoside. Again, related to a glycoside, and the only difference here is that we have a nitrogen uh, rather than a, an oxygen there. And so there's two N-glycosides of two sugars, D-ribose, two deoxyribose are particularly note noteworthy. Um, so here's D-ribose and here's two deoxyribose, so we're missing the hydroxyl here. And when we make an N-glycoside of these, we get um, cytidine. And two deoxyadenosine. Pretty awesome. You learned about that already, right? Didn't know there were N glycosides, did you? And probably wouldn't have been able to draw a mechanism for those for that formation, but now you could, right? All right. We're going to stop right there. Um, if you guys have test questions or any questions, you can come on up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>